Good afternoon. I'm Thilo Rehm, the director of STAR-C, the Science and Technology in Archaeology and Culture Research Center at the Cyprus Institute. And I'm going to introduce today's speaker, Professor Patrick de Gries. He is a professor of archaeometry at two universities, both in Leuven in Belgium and in Leiden in the Netherlands, which I think is a very nice example of being a European and being able to hold one post in two different countries. Now, in those two universities, he is leading a team of graduate students, postdocs, technicians, using methods of the earth sciences that focus primarily now, more recently, on archaeological research, without neglecting, I understand, the actual modern research in modern materials as well. Um, it shows simply that whatever we use today, concrete, glass, metal, cement, is everything based on earth raw materials, and it has been like that for the last 10, 20,000 years. And if we study that material and develop those materials today, using earth science methods, we can do that also in archaeology. And this is a very particular strength of the earth sciences, which is therefore one of the major foundations of archaeological science research. Now, Professor de Gries's research in archaeological materials, I think, goes back a good 30 years through your involvement first in the Sagalassos archaeological excavation project, a major project at the time of the University of Leuven which then um, Patrick got involved in analyzing building materials, analyzing soils, ceramics, as you do as an earth scientist. But as you moved on with that, I think you came across the more interesting or slightly more interesting materials such as metal and slag, iron, of course, as a very ubiquitous material. The site, I should say, is a Hellenistic site going into the late Roman period, so a good millennium of a time when iron was the common metal. But also you came across glass there. And a lot of that work was then published in, a, in an edited volume on Sagalassos and all the related archaeological science work, both with geological but also biological focus in that material because again biology, biological sciences is directly linked to the earth sciences as their literal foundation where plants grow and animals tread the soil. Somehow it seems you got stuck with the glass because soon after that um, there's an increasing flow of analyses that you produced on mostly Roman glass both in Belgium but also in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean, to the extent that the European Research Council saw themselves compelled to give you uh, quite a bit of money to run a project specifically on studying the archaeology of late Roman, uh, Roman glass, the Arc Glass Project, as a European Research Council grant. And that led to another book, Glass making in the Greco Roman world, results of that project, which is a, a very important reference work ever since, and enabled a lot of postdocs and PhD students to actually grind their teeth on that sort of material, if I may say so, um, exploring a wide range of avenues how to study and how to make sense of those analytical data. And I think that's one of the things that struck me early on when I, as an editor of JAS, came across that young man in that small country producing amazingly good papers in an amazingly steady flow and making archaeological sense of it, interpreting it in a way that actually meant something to the archaeologists, which must have led to the success of all of that research quite considerably, not just numbers, but numbers that have a meaning. You continued working in that field, branching out, I mentioned metal before, and you continued having an interest in metals, not just in glass, but also ceramics, obviously, as a, that 
primary material for archaeological earth sciences, clay changed into something archaeological through human agency and that is almost everywhere happening. You, I think, did that particularly in the Caribbean, which must have been a, a real challenge to do field work there, probably only matched by your glass research. One of the papers, I think, is called Isotopes on the Beach, um, which I think you have heard before in, in a similar context. So no, archaeology and, and earth sciences as a very fruitful combination around the globe. Um, and you, you maintained your teaching, a very intensive teaching load at the time, both for geology, geochemistry, and archaeological sciences, both inside the lab and outside. Um, creating a, a, a school of young people who were trained by you and continue doing that sort of work, which is another very important legacy of all what we do. It's not just the papers and books and so on. Well, you have 350 or probably a few more publications now produced. Um, more than 100 of them have been cited at least 10 times, several of them 150 times, so quite important impact. But it's a legacy of the trained people that continue your work into the future. Um, I just would like to say that I got to know you, as I said, more indirectly through my work as an editor. And it's only very recently that we started collaborating um, two years ago in that so-called promised project, the promoting of archaeological science in the Middle East, funded by the European Union where KU Leuven, the Cyprus Institute, and that famous, infamous British University in Cambridge, the three of us team up and exchange experience and staff and develop joint research projects. And I have to say it's been an extremely interesting and fruitful collaboration for, for us here, learning from all your experience and so on. So I'm, I'm delighted that after more than 25 years indirectly knowing you that we managed to, to get together even though we share that earth science background and share our interest in glass and metals. So it was quite, quite intriguing that we never managed to have a joint project before really. Now before I hand over to you I just would like to highlight some other interesting things that you can do in archaeological sciences. It's not just iron and ceramics and glass and all these things. There's a recent paper, I think, by you on the ancient Egyptian toothpaste and also on isotopes of something called antimony, which is a much more exciting and rare metal out there. So the globe is big. The periodic table of elements is containing almost 100 elements that you can play with as a geochemist and human agency and human creativity in making things out of these foundational materials is endless. So you have a lot more to do. You have achieved a lot already, but I look forward to reading your papers for the next 30, 40, 50 years to come. Well, I won't read that long, but anyway. Patrick, please give us the pleasure of giving us your talk from precious stones to utilitarian wares, isotope geochemistry in vitreous materials research. Thank you. Thank you, Matilo, for that much too kind introduction. I'd almost say I promised to never do it again, but uh, <laughs> that's not what is meant here. And thank you for having me. Um, it's nice to travel uh, these days. So this is the first uh, real physical presentation I've given in, in, in six or seven months. The other ones were always online or recorded, so it's good to go back to somewhat normal. Um, this talk is about isotope geochemistry and not. Um, we'll be looking at what is fundamentally a, a chemical technique applied in the earth sciences, which is lab-based, heavy, uh, wet chemistry that we do on, on materials. But um, we're trying to answer archaeological questions, and we should keep in mind that that is the most important thing in this discipline, what we do. And um, it is true that as soon as analytical techniques were invented in the geosciences, they were applied to archaeological research, quite literally, when, when techniques such as carbon dating or, or neutron activation analysis as a chemical analysis technique were 
literally invented short after the Second World War, the Manhattan Project, the, the scientists, the physicists developing these techniques literally knocked on the door of their neighbor colleagues that were anthropologists or archaeologists and asked for the material to analyze. So um, this, there is a long history of applying uh, earth scientific techniques to archaeological research. However, human behavior is quite complex and brings about some sometimes irrational uh, behaviors that are difficult to explain simply from a geochemical or physical uh, perspective. And so we should bear that in mind that archaeology has something to tell about the interpretation, the reasonable interpretation of um, geochemical data and a translation to reality, to human reality there is necessary. And so in this talk I'll try to um, give you a sort of walk through through geochemical techniques that often were invented as a nurse science technique but in their application in archaeology bring in much more meaning for the archaeologist, the archaeological uh, scientist. And we'll be applying this to vitreous materials, uh, mostly glass, with some excursion uh, into metals. We'll first start with what is, is called the earliest glass, the origins of man-made glass. And then we're in, in Mesopotamia, Egypt. There is a debate who was first. Well, actually, in archaeology, you can never tell who was first. You can always tell what was recorded first, but uh, or excavated first. We're in Mesopotamia, we're in Egypt with these, these type of vessels, these opaque um, glass vessels, some earlier material, um, our smaller objects, beads. Um, this is strong colored vitreous material glass. And so for, for the beginning of really glass as a material, as a common material, we're somewhere in the middle of the 14th century um, BC, 15th century uh, BC. And these, these glasses are actually a replacement of precious stones. Precious stones are um, a commodity that are used in ritual, in, in daily life, in exchange, in gift giving. And glass is a sort of equivalent material to precious stone. There is a lack of precious stone and, and some uh, authors have argued that the, the, the need for glass is driven by this need for precious stone. And so you have the example here of um, what is a core form vessel from uh, Mesopotamia. You see its state, which is slightly uh, in a lesser state than what you would see in Egypt. Of course, with the arid climate in Egypt, you get these perfect vessels, perfectly preserved, three and a half thousand years old. Um, this is the current state um, of a fragment in the Harvard Semitic Museum of Nuzi glass. Um, it looked like this, now it looks like this. This is how it came out of the ground in 1930, in this case, I think. Um, where color is lost, uh, which gives us uh, uh, some thought on, on how to preserve these objects. But this earliest glass, this is replacement of precious stone, this, um, this precious material gives us an insight into how these Mesopotamian Egyptian first states interact. Because this precious stone and glass as a replacement was so important in magic, in ritual, in gift giving, in diplomacy, we can look where the material was made, where the raw materials for making that glass uh, were obtained, what technology we see, and how this material moves about the world. And so one uh, aspect of this research is, of course, the usual archaeological, Egyptological approach uh, in this respect. You see the, the Hall of Annals in Karnak Temple, where you have a spoil dedicated to Amun-Ra, and you see the description of artifacts and one uh, of these um, uh, one of these descriptions of spoil from campaigns in Mesopotamia of Moses III is glass. Glass was taken uh, from uh, Mesopotamia and brought into Egypt. And so we know this material was traded. We have examples of, for instance, the Ulubrun shipwreck, which carries these ingots, these, this primary glass. We have descriptions, correspondence of diplomacy, uh, asking for glass for glass makers. So we have that record. But what we're trying to look into uh, in, in terms of material aspect with science, with earth science, is what raw materials um, were gathered, what is the technology of making this glass, and how is this glass exchanged? How does it move about uh, the known world uh, as a complement to the other sources that we have from archaeology? To briefly um, update you, this earliest glass is a mixture of a very pure silica source, probably quartz pebbles or a very pure sand, which bring in most of the silica that you need to make the glass. This is mixed with a flux to lower the melting point. Plant ashes are used for this. 
Soda is an important uh, melting point reducer, but this plant ash also brings in uh, elements such as magnesium, potassium, also brings in lime into the glass, which is important to, to have a stable glass that we can still find. And this glass, remember, is this strong colored uh, material uh, which needs a colorant and a pacifier. And there, there's a link to what you would find in metallurgy, to copper, uh, cobalt, antimony, lead, metals that you would find in early metallurgy, not necessarily directly linked, but the same materials in, in the form of ores must have been used in this glass industry. We'll come back to that later. So we can have a, a, a mix of particular raw materials in different areas in the world, inherited from the raw materials they use, a chemical composition that gives a fingerprint of origin. Beside uh, a lot of discussion on reuse of glass, recycling, remixing, contamination by tools, etc., but we won't go into that here. Basically, for the earliest glass, um, there's the Egyptian, the Mesopotamian production, where there is a technological aspect. What sort of metal or mineral, in this case, what sort of element do you use to make the opaque, strong colored material? And what technology is used? How, how is this added? And from chemical, standard chemical analysis, you can reconstruct these differences in technology, in in use, in production of different colors. And this has led to a debate, who was first? Because those assemblages are contemporary. The um, Mesopotamian assemblage is more limited in its technological capability, as you would call it. Which colors, in which way, how standardized is the production? And in, in how core form vessels are produced, usually you see that these are, are much less aligned. This feather pattern is less perfect than what you would find for the Egyptian equivalent. This debate is far from over, um, but it gives us an insight into type of glass and technology. And provenance, where does it come from? That's another aspect. Can we distinguish Mesopotamian from Egyptian production? If you find a late Bronze Age glass in the site, can we tell where it comes from? That has been researched through standard chemical analysis. Um, there are laser ablation methods where you take a micro sample, have caused a huge leap forward where you do not have to grind up half your glass vessel to get an analysis. Um, excellent technique to look at trace elements, for instance. This is work uh, referenced here. Shortland Ehrman and um, Nicholson and Jackson have shown the origin of the Uluburun glasses. Um, there's an Egyptian origin, there's a Mesopotamian typical pattern that you can distinguish. So why would I resort to uh, isotope geochemistry? to supplement that story. Why would I develop isotopic techniques to look at this late bronze age glass? If we can already tell this color is caused by this element, this is the technology, and even the provenance is, is quite established with standard techniques. Plus, with my um, isotope geochemistry, I have the issue that I do need to grind up a substantial part of my glass vessel and dissolve and destroy it to get extra information. So there is an ethical aspect to sampling and, and using of, of, of materials. This is a plot of two isotope systems that I've used quite a lot in the recent past, strontium and neodymium. And so neodymium actually tells me pretty much the same thing as um, the previous plot on silica source. Which type of silica, which type of sand or quartz is used in, in making glass? And there is a, a clear distinction between an Egyptian sand source or silica source and a Mesopotamian uh, silica source. This gives us basically the same distinction as in the previous plot. Strontium comes in with lime, with calcium in the glass, with the plant ash. And so while this mixture um, of silica and plant ash is typically a plant ash glass, typical for a late Bronze Age uh, setting of glass production, with the element content, you cannot tell more, but it is a plant ash glass. You see that there is quite a spread in this diagram of strontium isotopic signature, of, of variance of this value. And this comes in with geology. Um, that is one of the explanations, that the plants you use grow on a different soil. And so they inherit this strontium isotopic composition from the soil into the plant and then into the glass. And so this gives us more variance in composition and possibly more about production sites. And we see that the Egyptian production is quite standardized, homogeneous again, while the Mesopotamian one is quite spread. And so we're looking further into this, but it gives you the principle of why I would resort to isotope geochemistry on a material that is actually quite well known, because it can tell us more. It gives us another piece 
of the puzzle. Now, Tito mentioned antimony, uh, another recent interest. Antimony is sort of lost metal in, in ancient history and in archaeology. Actually, antimony knows a very long history of use, not so much as a pure metal, was unknown until the Middle Ages as a metal, but it is used so much in so many technological processes that it's spread all over the world without basically people knowing that it is antimony. Um, it's used, it's the main opacifier in early glasses up to the Roman period even. Antimony is used to make glass opaque, non-translucent. It's also an accidental uh, component in metallurgy, where in very early copper alloys you find antimony. Uh, you even find antimony metal. It was probably not recognized as such, as a separate metal, but it is produced from the 5th millennium BCE. It is made. And so antimony is, is one of these weird and wonderful elements that you find in so many technologies, unaware of the fact that it is antimony, but that is used in a mineral form to <coughs> obtain a specific technological process. And so antimony is, is very hard to study. Um, it occurs in these very minute particles in opaque glass, for instance, um, the yellow color, uh, lead antimonate, the white color, calcium antimonate. But where does it come from? And so this Mesopotamian Egyptian production centers, how do they get their antimony? Um, how, do they, how do they use it? That was what stirred up an interest in antimony in, from a technological and provenance point of view. And so we know that metallic antimony objects have existed for thousands of years. There is probably an independent invention in Italy. Um, they pop up for a couple of hundred years and then disappear again, and the signature is never seen again. And there is a lot of this antimony production, both as a metallic uh, material um, and in copper alloys in what is uh, modern-day Georgia, Russian border, Armenia, uh, the Caucasus, uh, that mountain range. There is basically the only logical source of antimony that you could look to. There is hardly any or no antimony in Mesopotamia and Egypt. There is mention of antimony in Turkey, but not much, not confirmed, and modern examples are from deep mining, irrelevant for archaeology. And there's occurrences here and there in Spain, Romania, which might have been even the only equivalent of, of real technological ancient use of antimony is in that Caucasus. So what we wanted to do was well, can we match Egypt, Mesopotamia, glasscraft to the Caucasus? So we need a method to, to match an element that is present in, in, in minor amounts in glass, that we have no real association with other elements, um, that probably comes in, as in a mineral form or a processed mineral form, to be mixed in with a glass patch with the silica and the flux, possible other metals for colouring. Um, so how do we do this? And so the thing that I did, as an isotope geochemist, think of is, is there a difference in antimony isotopic composition between different deposits? Is that inherited in the object? And can I link an ore deposit to uh, an archaeological object? And that gives me the first piece of the puzzle of where do they get antimony? And then I want to know how did they add it in what form? Would they have processed it? mineral to, to another phase, directly added, how can I see this technology, technologically? And that is ongoing research. The thing I want to speak to you about here is antimony isotopes. We tried our first chemistry in the lab, I think we published our first chemistry in the lab in 2012, which is eight years ago, um, where we had, okay, we had a proof of principle, we can measure it, and different ores do have a very large range in antimony isotopic composition. And then we started struggling, um, applying this, and we found no match, and, and what is happening really. And then we had to go back to fundamental chemistry, basically. What happens with antimony isotopes? To provenance an artifact, you need two preconditions. You need a separation in signature between possible sources, and you need the signature to be inherited in your artifact unchanged, or in a manner that changes but that you can control, that you know what fractionation change of isotopic composition is. And so for many of the systems that we know, strontium, neodymium, lead, that is proven or assumed that there is no change in or to archaeological artifact. For antimony, it proved that there was a fractionation possible, but not always. If you have a change in oxidation state and it is an open system, then a fractionation can happen. 
So if you have a closed system, or if no change in oxidation state of the antimony happens, nothing happens to your signature, to your isotopic signature. If both of these are yes, then there is a change of fraction. And it took us years to master that chemistry to be able to measure the isotopic composition in a systematic way and to estimate what happens with fractionation. And basically the key of thinking of this was that we had antimony ores from the Caucasus. We have this antimony metal beads which are, as a matter of speaking, found literally next to the ore. We have the objects there and they don't match. And so what you would then think is, oh, they imported different antimony to make those beads there, or the beads were made elsewhere. But why would you, why, how would that happen archaeologically? Would that make sense? It didn't. So the next option is there is fractionation. We now estimate this fractionation to be about three epsilon values. I won't go into the chemistry, but there is a systematic, and then suddenly it matches. Our beads, our ores, you know, what the, the produce in the same area does match. And then we can look at our early glass, at our late Bronze Age Mesopotamian Egyptian glass. Does it match diesel ores? Yes, it does. It does match the Caucasus. It does not match many of the other sources that we know. It's pretty much a unique match if you correct for the fractionation. And so this leads to a whole set of different questions now archaeological. Why does Mesopotamia and Egypt look to the same region for antimony? That could be just availability. It's the only place that they can go to. But how does that work? And why? And how does it travel? And that then leads to archaeological, anthropological research. One of the, the best known colors, this yellow um, lead antimonate, um, a mixture of lead antimony in a glass, an opaque yellow glass, is first used as an equivalent to gold. Um, the first glass has this gold rim foot, um, and suddenly yellow glass is used for this. And we find that the earliest of these yellow rims uh, in Mesopotamian glass use Mesopotamian lead. Um, and the first examples in Egypt also likely use Mesopotamian lead. And then the Egyptians revert to using Egyptian lead, Caucasian antimony, and make their own yellow glass. And that gives us a sort of story of how that antimony might have moved and what the timing of this is. If it first goes into Mesopotamia to make yellow glass, then goes to Egypt slightly later, and then Egypt uses its own lead source, that gives us a story that we're trying to unravel now. Um, but the first step is get this antimony isotopic system ready and measuring systematically so that it gives correct results. What we're thinking, the direction that we're thinking now, and this is very much work together with Andrew Shortland, um, is this magic and ritual in, in late Bronze Age glass. What is the role and, and, and the importance of antimony next to gold in glass making? So you could think of, when you see this technological table of, of copper for blue and antimony for opaque and lead for yellow, etc., it, it's, it reeks of metal in, in your intuition, in your gut feeling. What we're pointing to now is that probably these are two very separate industries that have nothing to do with metal. That they would use a different, you know, a different context for glass making and not look at, at metal craft at all, perhaps apart from precious metal, gold. And so glass making, early glass making, is this magical thing, is this ritual thing. Even in, in, um, in recipes that are known from early script, you have a sort of, you take a couple of scoops of sand, you walk around the furnace three times and say this prayer. You take the other scoop of flux and you slaughter a goat. And it's, it's sort of a combination of recipe and prayer. And so this ritual, magical aspect from the beginning of glass making is present. And so gold is again one of these precious materials. And so what we're looking into or trying to look into now that we have this antimony uh, technique ready, published a couple of weeks ago, I think, you know, uh, yeah. ticked off on it, um, <laughs> is can we say something about this link? The earliest antimony um, mined in the Caucasus, it's about 17th century dated this mine, secure dating, nothing to do with copper extraction, different area, different geology, but have everything to do with gold extraction. And so they are in the same place. Is there a link there? There's also some of these early glasses which have a very high gold content. And this has led um, Andrew Shortland to believe that they might have sprinkled gold into glass. There would be no function whatsoever to do that. It would be strictly a ritual aspect. If you can prove that, there's no functional thing to it. It would be one of those rituals. 
And so we're looking into is co-occurrence of antimony and gold linked to co-processing. They have some geological linkage. And so can we prove, can we push this further and see whether the early glass industry is more linked to precious materials, such as gold and precious stone, and totally independent for, from, from metallurgy. Um, an interesting concept here is that there is no ancient Egyptian word for yellow glass. All the colors have uh, an Egyptian word. Yellow glass does not. And that has led to the idea of, hang on, what if the word for gold also means yellow glass? And then suddenly some concepts do make sense. Those are lines of research that we're, we're heading into now because of this antimony isotopic research. So basically we're trying to, to link this into um, a model of production. What is the origin of antimony? Um, we now know that Mesopotamia and Egypt look to the Caucasus, both to the same sources. Stipnite extraction might actually be driven by glass demand, not so much independently, but or the demand of glass might be linked with precious metals rather than other um, antimonial copper, that sort of copper metallurgy. We have some um, glass beads that we were able to analyze from uh, those Caucasian contexts. They're all Mesopotamian, um, these early glass beads. We haven't found Egyptian glass in the Caucasus. I think it's Mesopotamia. So there is a direct link there of glass moving up and antimony moving down. How does that work? That's something that is, is a topic for, for further research to look at the dawn and rise of antimony production in the Caucasus and its link to uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Let's leap somewhat forward to, to a different uh, economical and social context, the Roman Empire. Um, we've spoken about this glass before glass blowing, this precious material equivalent to, um, to precious stone. Um, precious material, semi-precious stone, to the Roman Empire where glass has become, through the impetus of glass blowing, um, a utilitarian material. And so this is a material that you would find anywhere in the Roman Empire. Suddenly, um, it's a colorless material, it's translucent, it's utilitarian, it's it has every aspect of glass that we know today. It becomes an economic product. And probably, apart from the changes in, in raw material mixture, glass blowing was the invention that, that struck that up. Suddenly glass could be mass produced and could be rapidly produced and suddenly becomes a commodity on the everyday table. And chemically this glass is still very much like the glass we know today. It's a mixture of silica, which probably contains the lime in the silica, shell, limestone, in a beach sand, lime to stabilize the glass, silica to make the glass, and a flux that is now a mineral matter is natron. It's a sodium carbonate that evaporates in lakes. It's no longer plant ash. It's a mineral that you will exploit and mix with the silica source. We're no longer looking at strong colored material. We're looking at translucent. Why? Well, you want to see the contents of your vessel. You use this to serve food. You use this later in windows. You want to look through it. So the very concept of glass changes and is very much more like we know glass today. And so the question there, um, basically where this all started, was, um, Large tank furnaces, large production units of Roman glass and, and later Byzantine glass are known, are excavated from uh, modern-day Israel and some in Egypt, where you have tank furnaces. These are these two by four meter tanks where you make uh, a mixture of sand, nature on sand, nature on sand, nature, and you fire them for weeks on end, and you get this huge glass tile that you break up into small chunks transport all over the known world, and then in a secondary production location you can soften them, not really remelt, but soften into a viscous material and blow into the object you want. And so you have the separation, this, this division of production between the primary unit, um, where, you, where you mix sand and this natron, and the secondary unit where you shape your vessel. This, this is a model that's been uh, in use and, and hasn't been disproved for 20 years. Um, this is probably how it happened in the Roman Byzantine era. Now there is one little thing that um, Pliny writes in uh, 70 AD. He describes this glass production, and he describes these units, these large glass producing units in the Levant, which is Israel, um, Lebanon, Egypt, nowadays. But he adds in a couple of sentences other glass producing areas, glass making areas, this primary production from sand to glass. And what he adds is his birthplace, 
between Cume and Liternum in what is nowadays Naples, north, slightly north of Naples in Italy. He describes that there is an old fashion of making glass there. And he adds in one sentence, literally, the Spanish and Gallic provinces also make glass. Never was any evidence found in these areas of primary glass, these tank furnaces, of making glass from sand to glass. Not re secondary, plenty. Remelting chunks into vessels, plenty of evidence. Nothing of primary production. And so the question again was how can we distinguish a production from Egypt, from Israel, um, from a production in Italy or Spain or the Gallic provinces? And so you need this marker. Now, with regular element analysis, you want a translucent glass, not strong colored, as colorless as can be, that you can blow and that you can shape into any artifact you want. That limits the chemistry of the raw materials. You cannot have too much iron because your glass will become dark colored or even black. You can't have too little lime because it won't be stable, and a glass that dissolves in water is not very useful on your table. But you can't have too much lime, because then it won't be translucent, it will devitrify and give you crystals and not be a nice glass. You have to have enough silica, but not too much, because it, you need to be able to melt it. And this gives us a very small window of opportunity to actually make this translucent glass that you can blow. And so with usual major element chemical analysis, you will get overlap, between a lot of glass groups. And so glass made in, in Israel versus Spain is less likely to be well separated in those terms. And so what we invented was the use of neodymium isotopes. We've seen them before. They track the silica source. Neodymium is present as an element in minerals in a sand other than silica. They're present in many minerals, actually. Um, many of the minerals that are in a natural sand or in a silica deposit contain some neodymium. And so that neodymium is inherited in the glass. It is nothing technical in the glass. But depending on the geological age and composition of your mother rock that produces the sand, you can get a different neodymium isotopic composition. It basically depends on how old is your sand, when was, how old is, is the, the, the pallet material from which the sand was weathered, and what was its starting composition, how much uh, samarium that could um, decay to neodymium was present. And so basically the geology of Northwestern Europe is very different from the Saharan, North African geology, very different from Egypt and into um, Central Africa. And that gives you this different epsilon neodymium composition and hence a different basic composition between Egyptian Israeli sands, Saharan North African sands, and this European sand. And how much you get a mixture of these components in your beach deposit you get a different isotopic composition. And that's how we try to unravel the origin of Roman glass, using this epsilon neodymium next to some trace elements. Some of the sands will have more or less aluminium, some will have more or less zirconium, and we could basically distinguish a number of um, glass-making um, signatures that originate from a geographical area. Now, is this a very detailed provenancing? No. It gives you a broad regional signature. Is it enough to answer the question of was Pliny right or was he a liar? Yes, it is. Because the signature from Italy, Spain is very different from Israel, Egypt. So can we tell apart? We can. And actually you can make through time this change in signature. If you use very large sample numbers and you know the composition of the raw material, then compared to glasses, you can make this sort of diagram of when do certain glass factories start, when do others stop. Basically, to give you the summary, this is um, what Gatino showed. You can find it online. It's actually an open access publication. So you can find the full book and the database uh, online should you want to read the detail of this. Most of the glass that we find in the Roman era is this Syro-Palestinian or Egyptian origin. Um, very little of this glass is Western Mediterranean, but it is there. It does exist. In our last estimates, we have a couple of percent of glass that has a primary origin in the Western Mediterranean, mostly during the High Roman era, uh, first to fifth, first to fourth century um, AD, that's when other glass factories apparently are active. We have no evidence for an Italian production primary. Signatures, there's no suitable raw material there. Um, what we did suggest is that 20% has a primary origin in North Africa, what was classically dubbed as Alexandrian glass. It's, it's a very particular composition of glass 
that we did think, look, it doesn't match Syro-Palestine, it does match something else, but in our um, field studies we had little access to Egypt, it was the wrong time politically, um, but we could suggest circumstantially that there was this North African Alexandrian source. Um, we also could say that much of the glass, was about a quarter to a third of the glass, had a signature of recycling, of mixing different sources. So it gives us an insight into glass economy on a super regional scale. Now, coincidentally, this just appeared um, in, in Nature, um, scientific reports, by an excellent group in, Cop in uh, Aarhus, sorry, not Copenhagen, Aarhus, sorry, group. Um, <laughs> And they proved with hafnium isotopes this Alexandrian origin. What we didn't succeed with neodymium strontium, we did try hafnium and it didn't work in our case. They did. And so excellent work where again a new system answers a particular archaeological question. Very well done where you take a new system, hafnium in this case, there is a geological reason why Egypt and Israel have a different signature in hafnium isotopes because of its slower sands, etc. And they can answer the question, yes, this is an Alexandrian group, and it is clearly distinct from uh, the Levantine Syro-Palestinian production. Again, you choose your isotopic system to answer a particular question. First, you develop in earth sciences this system, or, or further develop it, and then uh, answer a question. Another one we did have a go at in this project is the source of the natron. There is one lake, or series of lakes, Wadi al Matun in Egypt, between Alexandria and Cairo, um, that is seen as the location, the origin of all natron in the whole world through time, which is sort of pushing it. We've been to these lakes, they still precipitate material, not really natron, but related minerals, um, depending on the weather, the hydrology, etc. Probably other minerals come out different times of year and through climatic change, through centuries, you will get a variance in deposition. Um, but we needed a tracer. Is this the only source? Do we see variants? Uh, or, or are other sources possible? It's hard to imagine that this would be the only source for all nature on all of um, throughout human history. Now, nature is, is a difficult material. It is very pure. It's sodium carbonate. Uh, there's very little other elements in there. And so that is chucked into a glass patch. And then you need to find a chemical marker that would point back to the source of the natron. And so the only thing we could think of was boron. Um, these salts do contain boron as an element. Now boron is a difficult one to analyze. It's very sticky, it's, it's a very difficult element just simply to analyze. Um, it's very light. Um, and so can we use these isotopes to link glass to natron in, from Wadi al Are there other sources? And can we see whether there is a difference? And the usual thing that was published is that Lake Picrolimni, I should be very careful with my pronunciation here, <laughs> I hope I pronounce it right, in Greece, would be a production site of natron. That sodium carbonate eva um, precipitates in that lake. And so the thing we did was, was look at boron isotopes, glass to salt. Can we compare? Is this consistent? Can we do the chemistry right? And then look at different natron sources and see is it a possible candidate? So the question here is, is this Greek lake a possible source for our Roman Byzantine natron glass or not? And are other sources distinguishable? In the meantime, David Mattingly kindly provided salts um, from Libya. Um, we've had, in the meantime, salts from the whole of North Africa. Even. And this is geologically very logical. You have this North African desert system. Wherever you would have a lake that has enough water, it would come through the same geology and possibly precipitate sodium carbonate. So there are a series of lakes that could supply natron other than um, Wadi al Natun in Egypt. And we saw that the signature of these lakes, this is actually an old diagram, there's a couple more, but they all um, sorry, concur on this line. There's, there's a bit of variance here. Um, sands can also contain boron, so there is an influx, of, uh, an influence of sand on the signature. You need to deconvolute. But for the purpose of this lecture, we can say that much of the Wadi Natrun and some of the Libyan salts, and there's also Moroccan ones, um, Tunisian ones, uh, they're on the same line, same ballpark figure. Our Greek signature, and in the meantime we've repeated this a couple of times, this is actually several samples, it's far away from it. So um, it does seem that the Greek source is not a relevant source for glass making, for nature and glass making while the other North African sources might all be a possible source. 
Can we distinguish between them? No, they overlap in signature, but we can't say that they're all viable candidates. And so for this whole class history of compositional types that you can unravel through major element chemistry, our isotope geochemistry can tell us something more on what the origin is, what the technology is, how this history of, of use and production might be. And um, a supplement to that is, don't forget trace element chemistry as well, apart from isotope geochemistry. Isotopes, there's very little groups doing it. I'm happy that more and more groups are coming into the field because that is necessary to develop new approaches to, to prove me I'm wrong um, in some aspects. Uh, but elements, certainly with techniques such as these ones, portable XRF laser ablation techniques, become more and more accessible. You can link um, certain elements to certain raw materials for a glass type, and they can give you extra information, and these are more and more easy to analyze. So that is something that we should not forget, that we keep looking back at simply contents and signatures, which are more easy to scan or analyze in depth than this isotope geochemistry. But isotope geochemistry is something that can teach us a lot still about provenance technology and human behavior. One field that is largely unexplored is the later glass. Plant ash glass that is no longer this halophytic early plant ashes, but wood ash, kelp, other glass compositions from the 9th century onwards when um, some areas revert back to the early plant ash composition, Europe, the Middle Ages, have this wood ash composition. There's a lot to do there with systems that are very well developed and that can perhaps give us more insight in how this material, the vitreous material industries were organized. Also, uh, vitreous materials, I say, not only glass, but glazes. Um, in this whole glaze research, there is a whole aspect that is unexplored of um, isotope geochemistry that can tell us more, much as it did before for glass, but now for glazes. The final remark to conclude. Um, isotope geochemistry in archaeology started very much with lead. There were some other oxygen as well, but um, some other systems were looked into. But the most, the one that was used most in the 60s and 70s on vitreous materials was lead isotopes. And then we ended up with a debate in lead isotope geochemistry about um, can we analyze lead isotopes properly? What is an ore field? Can we distinguish mines? And this led to a sort of fall of lead in the 90s, where, where lead isotopes weren't mentioned in polite company. Um, and so, but it is a perfectly viable system. And lead is one of these recycling indicators that we see. Now, elevated lead content is often an indication in glass making of recycling and of mixing. And simply knowing when there was more and less recycling and where this happened and how this traveled might be an interesting new look into glass economy and vitreous materials economy. And so, in terms of technical, analytical um, approaches, lead's been sorted. In terms of, of characterization of ore sources, we have a pretty good grasp on what an ore source is and what was done in the 80s and 90s of grouping an ore source by country is no longer done. You look at a mine or a group of mines or a geological situation and that's what you compare to. Something that we're looking into very recently is um, new approaches, probabilistic approaches to lead isotopes. And so no longer the Gaussian statistics, which have proven to be wrong for lead isotopes. Most of these don't have a normal distribution. It's not the right math. You have to look at it differently. So these kernel density estimates give us a better grasp on what ore fields are. What is the composition of an ore field? And then you can go to a probability. If you have a lead isotopic composition of an artifact, can you link it to an ore field? And you can do mathematical correct comparison to an ore field. What we want to develop is, is this type of thing, where for the different um, isotopic ratios, you get a likelihood that the ratio matches a certain ore source. And you no longer compare to all the ore sources in the world, but you look from archaeology what is likely. What am I looking at? What could it be? How likely is the match? Do I have a good match for all three isotopic systems that you measure fundamentally? Um, then there's a high probability. Um, is there no match with anything? Well, perhaps this is a mixed signature. Perhaps this is recycled or mixed. Can we sort this out? So this probabilistic approach, we just literally just develop the code and develop the math for it. That's not a geochemical problem. It's a mathematical problem on how you approach it. And that's what we're trying to tackle now. So as long as enough groups are dealing with this in terms of technical capability, 
we have enough very smart people to, to bring in these new ideas and new approaches. And I hope to have shown that there are many, many archaeological questions that are still open to be tackled with such a heavy technique as isotope geochemistry. I thank you for your attention. If there are any questions. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was a really great overview of what's out there in terms of the periodic table from boron, the very light, to hafnium, the very heavy, and a lot of things in between. Thank you very much for that. Are there any questions that we want to ask Patrick while he is here? Abby? Uh, Patrick, thank you very much. That was uh, very, very interesting. And it makes sense to our, to our minds. Uh, do we know anything about the plant ash used in early glass manufacture? What kind of plants? There, there should be plants with uh, a very high sodium content. All right. So the flux is soda based. Okay. Um, sodium is the essential element. So you look at desert plants. Halophytic plants, plants that are um, adapted to a desert environment and that have in, in their metabolism the possibility of managing these high salt contents, low water, that sort of thing. So that is, there are a number of uh, genera, salsola uh, and others that are suggested as sources. However, that is an interesting aspect to study because if you burn these plants to make ashes, first of all, we have to burn a lot of plants. And the conditions of burning these apparently influence the chemistry of the ash you obtain. And so there is a lot of soda in there, but the potash, magnesia, even the silica content of what you obtain in the ash is very variable. And so studying this uh, from a technological perspective is challenging. Also from a geological perspective, we suppose that the strontium in the soil unchangedly is inherited in the plant ash. From a bulk perspective, maybe that's true. But the soil might weather in a different way, in a different environment, with a different climate. Some minerals may weather, others may not. And the strontium is in different minerals. And so what is the rapport between soil and plant? There have been some tests on this, but not on a large scale. And so that is a whole field to explore on how that works from soil to plant, and then plant through technology to glass. Because I mean, I, this would be feasible if, if we, we found a glass manufacturer site in situ, I mean, excavated, not just take the glass, because then you can do phytolith analysis and see what's, what's uh, there. The same with the metal production, that we don't know, at least in Greece, what kind of wood uh, they were, they were uh, uh, using. Well, thank you, Abby. Do we have more questions? I was wondering, you mentioned recycling. Yes. And we know that in the, in the Roman period, when glass is so ubiquitous and so common, there was a very organized glass recycling industry, actually. The military were collecting broken bottles on the way home from the pub, probably. <laughs> um, and it was shipped around the, the Adriatic and so on. But what do you think about glass recycling in the late Bronze Age? Ah. Do we have evidence for that with when it's these precious stones heavily colored? Can you or can you not recycle that glass? There is a debate on it. Can, can you, in principle, yes if you separate colors. So um, if you look at what, if we go back quite a bit, you see these strong colored glass vessels, these, these core form vessels, with a feathering pattern in different colors. There we have one. Um, oh, sorry. Let's take a bigger picture with this one here. It seems to stick. It doesn't really want us to see this one. <laughs> so, uh, the feather patch. So, if we want to make a consistent when the control over the color of this glass, we need to separate this light blue from this dark blue, from this yellow, from other colors, to separate them and within color, melt them again and reuse them. What happens if we mix those colors? We will get a black blob that, you know, technologically possibly, it's, it's, you, you, you're able to form it, but it will be this black froth. And you, what is special about this glass is that you want control over this opaque color, because that gives meaning to the glass. Also, black is found in, in late rods, it's very rare. There is a connotation to each color. And so, yellow is gold, is amunera, is the sun, 
Um, green is life. Um, blue, you can see water, denial, etc. Life, black, not a good color. That's curse, it's death. You do find black glass, but always in a bad context. And so that's what you not want. So you need to have control. Technically, it is possible to recycle these glasses. But how are you going to separate colors? This vessel is, is maybe 10 centimeters high. So you can see the, the fineness of the pattern. And you have to separate those colors into each color category to then be able to recycle this. So technically, is it possible? Yes. Practically, is it possible? I would say no. And we have no evidence for it that they were recycling this type of glass. And that is probably why you still find much of these, these shards. They've discarded. You can't use them anymore. Good, thank you for that. Any other questions or if not, yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, Patrick, for the presentation. It was great. I was wondering how much sample do you want to do the isotopic analysis? How much sample? Yeah. Um, with wet chemistry, um, you're looking at 200 nanogram aliquots to answer your technical question. So you calculate the content in your material. You have to have a couple of milliliters to be able to analyze it. And then you can calculate how much milligram in an ideal composition you would separate from that sample and bring entirely into the solution. Of course, there's a margin of error with you separate that element through ion exchange chromatography. You have to transfer it a couple of times. So double that amount and then you have the minimal amount of material. Usually what we ask is 100 milligrams of materials to be able to go through the process. We can, we have found ways to simultaneously isolate strontium and neodymium, for instance. We don't need two times 100 to do both elements. So depending on the content and on the procedure, they are small amounts, uh, a couple of 10 to a couple of 100 milligrams um, in wet chemistry, but still for that type of vessel, that's a lot of material, that's visible clipping of an artifact. And um, there is the solution of using laser ablation. In some circumstances, you can use a laser where you have a couple of tens, a couple of dozen micrometer hole in your object, hardly visible to the naked eye. And for high content materials, high strontium contents, high lead, that's perfectly feasible. Neodymium, for instance, it doesn't work. Antimony, we haven't tried simply because of the fractionation. Um, laser will induce fractionation, and we've already had a lot of trouble with our wet chemistry, leave alone with our laser ablation. We simply haven't tried it yet. That's a whole series of unknowns to, to come to enough material on the mass spectrometer to do the measurement. Good. Thank you very much. Let me thank you, Patrick, again for your very interesting talk and for coming here. Thank you. And <laughs> goodbye. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for watching. Thank you.